Hello and welcome to Ukraine in Flames, a special project delivered to you by Ukraine Crisis Media Center, Ukraine Catholic University's Analytical Center and NGO EuroAtlantic Course. This is our 30th episode, so thank you for staying with us. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to our channel to stay tuned. My name is Alexandra Sekhanovska. I'm the head of Hybrid Warfare Analytical Group at Ukraine Crisis Media Center. And today we talk about all the reasons, political, cultural, historical, that may made Russian war against Ukraine possible. While many, mostly in the West, have considered February 21st impossible, Ukrainians have actually been living under the direct threat of open large-scale war since 2014, if not before. And we often say that this war is existential. Russia has never truly worked with its imperial and uh, totalitarian past, and the imperialist optics through which it perceives Ukraine are still in Intact. We started deconstructing the problem of this colonialism manifested now in the suffering of Ukrainian people for wanting to preserve their national identity. And we do this deconstruction with the following speakers. Dr. Hanna Shellist, editor-in-chief at UA Ukraine Analytica. Polip Polyenko, a film producer, head of the board of the Ukrainian Film Academy. Vita Dumanska, leader of the Chesno Civil Movement. And Larissa Yakubova, PhD in Historical Sciences and corresponding member of the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. And we start this uh, conversation with an amazing overview from Dr. Hanna Shellist, who carefully explores the main political reasons and international landscape that have enabled the Russian Federation for this war. That is a very good question, why the Russian aggression became possible uh, against Ukraine. And that is probably the question that we will be hearing for the next 10 years, at least both from the politicians and experts, and many university professors will be trying to answer it. However, it seems to me that as for now, we can uh, uh, signify at least several issues that definitely are important to follow, trying to understand how the events of February 2022 and 40 days after these became possible. First of all, that is definitely a certain excuse or closing the eyes to the events of 2014. The illegal annexation of Crimea and what happened after this in Donbass, the soft reaction from the Western countries and of the world community the very weak sanctions definitely gave a signal to the Russian leadership that uh, their action will not have the proper counteraction. The second reason is the certain appeasement policy that we uh, have seen not only the last eight years, but especially within the last year. When we already knew that the Russian Federation is bringing more uh, weapons and more personnel for the exercises uh, and uh, playing with the muscles to the borders when Ukraine. When the Russian Federation been uh, acting very aggressively in the Black Sea region. We heard uh, calls for the dialogue, calls for the understanding, calls for the meetings, except of the giving a very strong uh, signals to the Russian Federation what will be done in case they violate uh, the international law and start any type of the aggression. Reason number three is that we've not been working with other countries that Russia been building as the coalition. So Russia always thought that even if the relations with the West will be bad because of the aggression against Ukraine, there will be other other countries like China or India or the Middle East that will be working up with them. But also the most important issue is probably that we were not following very um, good what been happening in uh, Russia in, uh, inside. And that is really important to understand that it is not the West or Ukraine who are guilty in the current events. Don't try to find the excuses from the victims because definitely we needed to uh, be very attentive about the race of nationalism inside of the Russian Federation. We saw it in their uh, TV programs, we saw it in their news, we saw it in their statements and the international fora, we saw it in their entertainment industry. And this level of nationalism and xenophobia against the West, anti-Western propaganda, not only anti-NATO, but in general anti-Western propaganda, anti-Ukrainian propaganda, been really increasing and building that social support that we have now, when as a result 80% of population support um, this war and Mr. Putin activities. But also it's been a very strong building of the security services and their activities when everything
attention is concentrated on uh, one person and the loyalty to him. As a result, with no opposition, with these built of nationalism, even among the liberal uh, population in the Russian Federation, uh, we allowed the sentiments uh, to be acceptable for the society. That's why we see now that even if the decision of attack being uh, taken just by the Russian president, we see the strong support of the population. We don't see the opposition not only inside of the security services and military, but also among the uh, population. So it seems to me that when we would try to search for the uh, um, explanations why these became possible, it always will be important to start from the analysis of the developments of the last 10 years in the Russian Federation, understanding the social, political, even economic uh, reasons of what been uh, happening uh, there. And only after this to understand how our reaction, both in Ukraine and in the Western countries, sometimes been wrong when we preferred not to notice the signals that being sent to the international community. Please welcome Pilip Ilyenko, who is a representative of the artistic community and someone with deep knowledge of how important culture is in shaping the person's worldview or the worldview of a nation, talks about the cultural reasons behind the Russian war against Ukraine. The war which Russia started against Ukraine was uh, inevitable from my point of view. That is because uh, the Russian state continues to exist uh, as an empire which it was for many centuries and uh, that uh, empire its idea its main myth its uh, main uh, historical concept is based uh, on the idea that ukraine should be an uh, individable part of uh, that great empire. The main ambition of uh, today's government of Russia is to rebuild the Russian empire in its, uh, let's say, best condition, to regain the territories and to return its uh, power on the international uh, scale. The main uh, historical and ideological concept of Russian empire could be described in three words that uh, Moscow is third Rome. So the first Rome is Rome, the second Rome is Constantinople, Byzantium, and the third one is Moscow. And that connection is mainly through the statehood of Kiev, which is the capital of uh, Ukraine. That is why the, even the idea of that uh, Ukraine uh, is a sovereign state and Ukrainians are the separate nation is uh, something which is not tolerated in Russia. They consider that Ukrainian state is a failed state, that Ukrainian nation is not a real nation and Ukrainian language is uh, not in fact a language, which is uh, obviously not uh, true, but but that is the official position of uh, not only Russian propaganda, it's a general opinion as we see now. So for three decades, while Ukrainian was building its uh, sovereign state and uh, let's say reviving its culture and national spirit, uh, Russia was trying to stop it, uh, to undermine it in different ways. One of the main ways was uh, to use its culture and language to embrace uh, Ukraine and uh, to bring it to the so-called Russian world, uh, which uh, is something larger and bigger than Russian state itself. But all these attempts have uh, failed. Uh, they tried a lot and this left them with no choice, uh, the direct uh, invasion. That is why this war in all forms it will take, it might take, will not uh, stop until uh, the Russia will cease to exist uh, as an empire and uh, I'm not talking about the change of the political regime. I'm talking about the change of the concept of Russian state, uh, of the main myth, of the main ideological basement of that uh, state. Until that changes, even if there will be peace for some time, it will be only break in war. It will only postpone the conflict and it will rise uh, again and again and again until Russia stops to be an empire and it only then could be Russia brought back to the community of civilized uh, nations because otherwise it will be eternal threat to the security of uh, the whole world.
Our next speaker, Vita Dumanska, who is the leader of Chesno civil movement, walks us through Russian political techniques in Ukraine and abroad, aimed at polarizing the society and thus laying ground for the war. Let's learn more about what and why uh, Russia did trying to control modern Ukraine and how it started the war preparations after these efforts proved to be of no avail. Russia has been preparing to that war for a long time. It worked through propaganda and through funding pro-Russian political forces. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, a Russian KGB do a lot in terms of Russification of Ukraine. They were trying to establish so-called puppet government, but when Ukrainians did the wrong choices, support the wrong political forces or wrong policies, we have to protect that choice. That's why Orange Revolution and the Revolution of Dignity happened. Russian messages are not tending for more than 20 years. At the beginning of 2000, pro-Russian politicians in Crimea, they use a leaflet and they trying to show the NATO as the goblin hand which is under Crimea Peninsula. Still that time they are polarizing Ukrainian society towards towards NATO, towards Russian uh, language. Before the Orange Revolution, they created video as well. They distributed a leaflet where Ukraine was divided on three different sorts of people. So they were trying to make people of South and Eastern region feel more sympathy to Russia. When we had a referenda in 2014, they were using also Nazi symbol and swastika was under Crimea territory if it was in Ukraine and nice looking Crimea Peninsula was if it's on Russian control. So messages are still the same and Putin if he talks about the Nazification of Ukraine he uses all the myth that Russian propaganda was creating for years. But be aware, uh, Russians uh, invested in propaganda not only in Ukraine. Now we can clearly see the politicians from Hungary, from France, from Germany, which in their rhetorics use uh, messages which may be paid by Gazprom. So that war was prepared for a long time. We move on to deeper exploration of this complicated past, and Larissa Yakubova, a historian and member of the National Academy of Sciences, talks about the importance of truly learning the lessons of history. It seems that Russia has skipped the school and didn't do its homework on dealing with totalitarianism, so now we see it back at the door. But unfortunately, Ukraine has a front seat. Let's find out more. Чому російсько-українська війна стала можливою? Шукаючи відповідь на це питання, слід від початку домовитися, що зрозуміло, одна людина може її почати. Але здійснити її з самотужки неможливо. Для цього слід мати карбланш від народу і принаймні мати можливість в тривалий час спиратися на його демографічну потугу. Крім того, цей народ має добровільно бути готовий вмирати щодня для того, щоб ця війна тривала. Колективний Путін і російський глибинний народ згодні і хочуть знищити Україну. Знов таки, чому? Зрозуміло, що на це є дуже багато відповідей. І вони перебувають в низці площі. І соціально-економічні, і політичні, і культурні, і багатьох інших. Але однією з провідних в даному випадку виступила площина історична. За що Росія хоче знищити Україну? Чим так українці? Не догодили в Москві. За що братський народ хоче задушити українські в своїх обіймах? Тут, як не де інде, минуле керує сучасністю. Варто сказати, що докорінна відмінність між українцями і росіянами нинішніми перебуває в ставленні до свого минулого. На відміну від українців, які 30 років Працювали над своєю тоталітарною травмою, розгрібаючи страшенні катаклізми і травми свого тоталітарного минулого, росіяни закрили очі і вуха, і не бажають бачити і чути крики своїх знищених пращурів. 
Саме це відсутність покарання катів і здатність покараних без невинних часто густо жертв сприймати це як належне перетворило радянський лад на живого трупа. Він сконав, але лише в Україні робота з осмислення цієї травми тривала. Натомість в Росії розгорталася і набирала чим далі з обертів сталінізація. Повернення Сталіна в публічний простір Росії і перетворення його на ідейного батька російської нації, а показники його підтримки як видатної постаті російської історії стало сягає 39% засвідчує тоталітарний реверс сучасної Росії. Путінська Росія і російський народ – на жаль, завершили свій посттоталітарний транзит фатальним фіаском. Посттоталітарний транзит Росії закінчився інсталяцією тоталітарної держави і відновленням цілковитим соціальних тоталітарних практик. Сучасна путінська Росія – це тоталітарна держава, яка зрозуміла пропозицію Європи поширити європейський лад від Лісабону до Владивостоку, як пропозицію перетворити цю, цю територію на улах. Допоки це так, екзистенційна загроза нависає не лише над Україною, а над усім цивілізованим світом. There are, of course, many other reasons that we didn't have an opportunity to tackle so far and that we hope to return to later. But we can agree that the lack of proper detotalarization process, unassessed imperialism and consistent use of political and hybrid tools to weaken Ukraine were among the key factors behind the Russian war and enabling this war. You've been watching the special uh, project Ukraine in Flames delivered to you by Ukraine Crisis Media Center, Ukraine Catholic University. Analytical Center and NGO Euro-Atlantic course. If you find our job useful, which we hope for, please uh, like and share this video and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. In the description to this video, you can find information on how you personally can help Ukraine in the face of the Russian aggression. And remember that everything is going to be Ukraine.